Good morning. good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? You know, I heard at the end of that music today, J.R. said, sing it again. <laughs> I don't ever remember anybody say, preach it again, <laughs> after I finished. <laughs> oh, but it was good. I would hate to have to sing that. I don't think I get the words out fast enough. It took a lot of breath, I think. That was wonderful. You know, every Sunday, I, I seek to be encouraging, relevant, and memorable in what I say. And every Sunday, I preach out of the Bible, and I think it's always good. This Sunday, I feel like this is very much so um, appropriate for our day and time. And we've been going through the cities, the ancient cities, uh, of the book of Revelation. Now we're at number seven. So we've been through all the six, and we're to the last one. And this is a church that had trouble being lukewarm. And I think today about the situation of the church in our country. And I think at best, it's lukewarm. There's a new book out by Jim Davis, called The Situation of the American Church, and uh, he has worked with a, a comprehensive study by a social scientist named Dr. Ryan Burge, and he's discovered that we are currently in the largest religious shift in the history of the United States. That in the last 25 years, 40 million American adults have left the church in our country. Now, uh, on a percentage scale, that's the largest shift in the Civil War was the second largest shift, and that was with people not going to church, coming back to church after the war. Well, this is the opposite direction. In fact, it's 1.5 times greater than the opposite direction. To put the numbers in perspective, in terms of numbers, more people have left the church in the last 25 years than came to the church through the first great awakening, the second great awakening, and all the Billy Graham crusades combined. That many people have left. And we're in a time period here after the pandemic where we're at 85% across the country of the people that we had before. We're less than we were before the pandemic. I'd hope it would go the other direction. But it has allowed us, and I think it does allow us, to focus on something that is really necessary. Um, one, one of the, This guy, uh, Jim Davis, puts it this way. He says, 2023 will give us an opportunity to address this underlying crisis that's been happening for decades, the decline of the church. And it's time that we did something about it. It's time that the Lord moves us to step up, and it's not going to happen in a lukewarm church. It's just not. I got a map here you probably can't read, but it shows the decline just since uh, the last 20 years. And you might think, well... The baby boomers are all still going. Well, here's something that happens with age. In 2023, the oldest boomers turn 77, and the youngest will celebrate their 59th birthday. Are, are any of us here going to live forever? <laughs> we got two. Maybe in heaven. In heaven. But unless Jesus comes back, the boomers will be gone. Good news is weekly church attendance by generation, if you look at these ladies' statistics in the last few years, the younger people with the green line is going up. A lot of the uh, younger generation are starting to come back. In fact, generation, they call them Generation Z. Young man that did the welcome this morning is Gen Z, is the most unchurched generation. It's also the most open generation to spirituality. They've done this survey of the rise in spiritual hunger. It's the next slide. There's a spiritual hunger within young people today that was missing for a generation. 
Uh, and so we're excited about that. We took two bus loads to see this journey trails yesterday of teenagers. It's good to see that. Do y'all remember back in the uh, 70s when we had a youth program that was just booming? Some of y'all maybe were part of that. Uh, anyway, that seems to be coming around again, but it does not happen with lukewarm churches. And this same warning that Jesus gave the church in Revelation and Laodicea, he told him this is so perfect for us today. He said, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. And you might think, well, why would he re- wish that anybody would be, would be cold? Well, if you think about it this way, um, he prefers, God defer, prefers dealing with people who are hot, who are zealous for him and doing his works, or cold that not converted because they know at least they're lost. It's hardest to reach those people who are half-hearted in their faith. It's the way it's always been. And so John says, so because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Not very good. You ever tasted something and you felt like that? I don't like that. This is what Jesus says. He feels about lukewarm churches. Now we've we've looked at all the seven churches, got a map here, all the seven churches. We started off in Ephesus and then on this mail route to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, Philadelphia, and finally what may be the worst church of all of them is Laodicea. Laodicea's got so many, it doesn't have anything positive that uh, he says about it. And so to understand what it means today, we need to understand what it meant then. And so thank goodness we got Mayor Jason here today with us. So welcome, Jason. Jason, Mayor of Laodicea. Yazos. Yazos. Laodicea was named after there was a Greek ruler named Antiochus II, and his wife, which was also his, I believe it was his uh, niece, (laughs) was named Laodice. And so the city was named after this woman that he was married to for a brief period of time and then divorced her, but the name stuck to the city. She was a beautiful woman named Laodice. Laodicea, my city is very well off. We are rich. Isn't that good? (laughs) Yes, we're the richest of all the seven cities. We're rich because we had this special kind of wool from this sheep. It was really beautiful black wool that people love to make clothes out of it. Also, we had a great bank industry, and also we had a medical school. That was uh, known for working with people who had eyesight issue. There is a special kind of powder we had called Phrygian powder that people would use on their eyes and they could see a lot better. So we took those, those different industries, made a lot of money, a lot of money. In fact, we had a terrible earthquake that destroyed a lot of the buildings and the Romans said that we'll come in and rebuild it for you. We didn't need their help. We did it all by ourselves. We took just some of our money, and we rebuilt it better than ever before. Here's a map showing you where we are. We had the blessing of being right on the trade route. So from Ephesus and Philadelphia and the other cities, they would come through us to go into the other parts of the Asian empire. Today, you think of it as Turkey. Uh, This is where we are. We are the city of Laodicea. We were on the top of a plain that people would come through. Now, I don't have any of the beautiful pictures because, of course, we didn't have cameras when I was uh, alive, but here's what it looks like today. This is the road to Ephesus, and there were colonnades. There were columns on both sides of the road. Next picture shows these columns. It was a beautiful, beautiful city, the best of everything, the best. We had three theaters Okay, this is one of them that set lots of people, and we'd have all kinds of entertaining things. We had great temples. This is one of the remains of the temples. There's actually a lot of remains. And so it was a great city in many ways except one. We had bad water, bad water. 
and it, it was uh it was no natural water the city was built because it was on a trade route not because there was any springs and so we had to use, use aqueducts to move the water from a long ways away in pipes and the water was had sulfur in it and so as time went by it caused uh, the pipes to grow smaller and smaller because the sulfur solidified. And so lower and lower water pressure, it meant that the water was lukewarm when it got to us. It was never cold, never hot, and it also smelt bad. And so we didn't have good water, but you know, that's okay. We probably drunk a lot of wine anyway. But uh, near us, <laughs> there was great water. In one city right next to us, they had a, from the Mount Hermas, they had these, this water runoff that was really cold, ice cold. But by the time we shipped it to us, it was warm. And then Heralopagus, another city near us, had hot baths. And they are really known for going to the hot baths and, uh, and being renewed in those kinds of things. But we didn't have any of that. But it's still a great city. And I hope you get to visit us sometime. So goodbye from Mayor Jason and Deo. And Deo. So let's go and see what words were written to this city. First, it begins with words of greeting. It says, to the angel or the messenger of the church in Laodicea. Remember the, the name of the church is named after Laodice who was a woman in the first century that was uh, his, his wife, it says to the angel of the church in Laodicea, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Now, when you, we use the word amen, it usually, when the choir does a good, you know, like today, you say amen after it's over with because that's kind of a saying, that is good. We really like that. And so we do that a lot here. Every once in a while, I hear amen while I'm preaching. Uh, and, but, but, <laughs> but in their day, the word amen meant a little something different. Uh, sometimes a prophet would announce uh, on a hill the, the, the law of God. And after he would say part of it, the people would say back to him, amen. And it was a covenant oath for them. It was like they're saying, okay, I'm with you. Amen. And so here, Jesus is describing himself as the amen. Uh, he says, I am the amen. I am faithful. I am true. And I am martis the witness, the ruler of God's arche. We get the word archaeology, uh, creation, comes from that Greek word, and it means that he was before uh, the world was created. Jesus was. He wasn't just created when he was born on earth. He begins the letter like that, and he says, uh, by the way, this letter, this city is mentioned other places in the Bible. Uh, the city of Colossae was right next to this city. And so the letter to Colossians includes a word about the Laodiceans. In Colossians 4, 16 and through 18, uh, Paul writes, after this letter has been read to you, see that's also read to the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. We don't have that letter. It's missing. Now God, for some reason, didn't want us to, or we'd have it. And it says, Paul says, to our Archippus, which may have been the messenger, see to it that you have you complete the ministry you've received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So the Bible is linked together in many ways. And so these opening words are to the church. And then he says words of weakness. There's no words of praise to this church. This church has many uh, problems. Revelation 3.15, he says what I already read to you a minute ago. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Now, you can imagine people understood the cold water of the city next to them that got run off from the mountains. They could understand the hot springs, and then they could understand that their water was not that. 
It was cold. Excuse me, it was not cold. It was lukewarm. It smelled bad. And he says, I know your deeds are like your water, which is not good. Even though they thought they were rich, they thought there were all that, they really weren't. Jesus tells a parable uh, in Luke, he says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I'll store, store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And he said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not, as, is not rich toward God. You see, they thought they were well off and they were doing great. They didn't need any help from anybody. You know, anytime a group of God's people get to feel that way about themselves, you are in trouble. I heard about the church in Texas that they found oil on their property. They put in an oil well and raised millions of dollars through that oil well. The money went to the church. People quit giving. They built fancier and fancier buildings for themselves. It was just a terrible thing for the church. And this church, they thought they were all together. They were rich and they were, they were uh, doing so well. But, you know, to think of yourself that way, to think of yourself, it's okay to say, okay, the Lord has blessed us, but to be bragging on how good you are and how much you got, that's not the way you should be. Uh, there was a man named John Gerstner once, and he said this, and I've been thinking about this, this is something to think about. If you're capable of being insulted, you are no Christian. You know why? Because we are all sinners. We are all fallen. And if you think, if somebody says something to you, even though you might not have done what they said, you've done something like it. <laughs> well, all of us are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. And so he tells these words to this church, these words of warning, because they have been lukewarm. He says in 16, so because you are lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold, I'm about you to spit you out of my mouth. In Spanish, they called spitting vomitos. <laughs> it's not pleasant. And he says, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Paul said to this, he said to he, about himself, he said, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? You know, if we realize how much we need Jesus, we don't go away from that being proud. They were proud. They were proud of all the things they had. And so Jesus says to them, you say, I am rich. You say that you have required wealth and do not need a thing, but you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. That's pretty strong words. You think you got it all, but you don't got it all. And he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich. And that comes from doing my will. And white clothes to wear, not the black wool that you've been using. So that you can cover your shameful nakedness. And salve to put on your eyes so that you can see, not that Phrygian powder, but, but what the, the, the knowledge of yourself and the world you live on, so you can live in, so you can see, actually see things. So he rebukes them hard. He said, you're poor and you're naked and you, you, you have many problems. Now, the good news of this is he says, those whom I love, I what? Rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. You know, church isn't always to come and be uplifted. Sometimes we need to come and be, you know, convicted. It's part of what the Bible does. It convicts us. The good news is, where is Jesus in all this? This is, I memorized this verse when I was really young. I bet you did too. It says, Revelation 3.20, here I am, says Jesus. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears me, my voice, and opens that door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And so God is not pushing the door in. 
to get into your life. He does not force himself on you. He, what, he does not break the door down. He knocks on the door. He asks if you will open the door and invite him in to your life. Okay, And when you do that, it says he'll sit down and eat with you. Who do you eat with? People you get along with, usually. Yep, that's why Baptists have so much eating, all right? We eat all the time. I can't imagine many Baptist preachers are skinny, you know? My mother used to say, I'd never trust a Baptist preacher who doesn't like fried chicken. <laughs> Well, there's, there's, you know, something about the fellowship that happens. And then he says, a words of reward. He says, to the one who is Nike, victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. And so the good news is, even though that they are off base in a lot of ways, if they turn and if you and I turn to God, and no longer be lukewarm in our lives, then we can be with God in paradise, be with him in heaven. And the closing words, just like it's been with all the other churches, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so I've got a few questions to ask us today. And if you're going to go to eat lunch today with somebody, ask these questions to yourself. The first one is this. Is our church cold, hot, or lukewarm? What is it? How do you feel like it is? I hope it's hot. I hope it's not just lukewarm. I, I was in seminary, and I was uh, uh, with a group of guys in my hall, and we were all about the same age. And um, one of the things that we would do is, is preach as fill-ins at churches in the area. And so one of them came in one night, and he was wore out. And so we were all interested, well, how did it go? How did it go? He said, well, it was kind of rough. He said, it started out rough, but it got better. And we said, well, what happened? He said, well, I got there, and it was a country church, and there was about 50 people there. And he said, uh, I got up to preach, and I went to preach. He'd only preached like twice before. And I got up to preach, and this lady in the back Everybody called her Granny, said out loud, right as he got up there, turn on Jesus. And he says, oh, okay. <laughs> so I started to preach, and I got out two sentences, and she said it again, turn on Jesus. And so he thought, hmm, what am I supposed to do? And so he opened up the Bible, and he started reading his text. He read one verse of it, and she said it again, turn on Jesus. And so he, he raised his hands. He said, can somebody help me with this? I don't know what she's wanting me to do. And so uh, the deacons of the, the entire deacon board went up on stage, which was actually one guy, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, one guy, and his name was Merle. And Merle came up on stage and said, Pastor, let me help you out. Well, behind him, there was a picture of Jesus on the side of the wall. And I had a little lamp cord leading to it, and somebody had forgot to turn the lamp on. <laughs> and you know, that, that little thing was bothering, that was a tradition of the church. Every Sunday when, that past, when the pastor got up to preach, he would turn on the lamp. <laughs> turn on Jesus. It is interesting to me, some of the traditions that we put into the church that aren't in the Bible. All kinds of traditions. Does that make you uh, on fire? church? Sometimes I feel like the traditions we give people, they don't understand, and so it makes it harder for them to come to Jesus instead of easier. There was the church that I was part of, my first church, Lebanon uh, uh, Baptist Church. It was, a, it was a wonderful church, but they, would have, they had old hymnal. Lem, you don't know what this is, but they had shaped note hymnal. Do you know what that is? Instead of a staff, they had triangles and different shapes for the notes. Anyway, Dewey Long was the, was the song leader, and he was upset when we actually put carpet on the, uh, the podium because he liked to stomp while he was leading the music. <laughs> 
And whenever they had a new person in church, they always did not this number. I forget what number it was. I think it was like 58 or something. They did number 58. And it was a Southern gospel old hymn that was really fast until one part where everybody was to stop. And if a new person was there, they would know that. They'd get into it and they'd keep singing and everybody would say, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and we do that kind of stuff. We do that kind of stuff. We make it, make it uh, you know, kind of this is what we do. Listen, the only thing we need to be teaching people is the Bible. We get so hung up in our tradition sometimes that we don't let the gospel shine. We need to be sharing the gospel, the good news here. And so not only I'm asking today, is this church cold, hot, or lukewarm? A a really important question, is your relationship today with God cold, hot, or lukewarm? Today, right now, if we had a thermometer, put it in your mouth, (laughs) would you be cold spiritually, hot spiritually, or lukewarm? You're supposed to be hot. We hope that we are. But if we have a church of cold people, we ain't never going to get any hotter. If we have a church of lukewarm people, that's not way to, you got to have the Holy Spirit come into your life and warm your life before you start looking at other people and saying, oh, our church didn't like hot like it needs to be. Well, maybe you aren't. That's me as well. We need, to, we need to be passionate about God. And so next question is, what keeps you from being passionate for God? What keeps you from doing that? Maybe the time you spend or don't spend in his word. Maybe the time you spend or don't spend in prayer. Maybe the time you spend or don't spend in doing his work in this community, reaching people, sharing your faith with others. We ought to be passionate about those things. Sometimes we get passionate about things that don't make, make much difference. You know, I, I, uh, uh, I remember this, uh, this church in Florida I read about, and uh, this church in Florida had a new person start coming to church, and they had not been in church uh, forever. And uh, this guy had gotten in trouble. He, he'd, he'd had a lot of money, but he forgot to pay his taxes. You know, they don't, they don't like that when you forget to do that. And he finally got caught up by the IRS. And uh, anyway, they released him on his own reconnaissance. And he started going to church. He was like at the bottom of his lifetime at that time, and he started going to church, and the pastor told him about the Lord and led him to the Lord, and he, he started really getting on fire for God. And he had a whole lot of questions because this church in St. Petersburg, Florida, was a traditional church, and traditional Baptist churches have a certain things they do that you, we get used to, but he didn't know, and so he would ask a lot of questions. For instance, his name was Van. Van noticed that at this church, all the deacons sat on the front row. Except he didn't know they were deacons. He just knew that the same guys sat on the front row every Sunday. And so he went to the pastor and said, how come those guys get the front row every Sunday? And the pastor said, well, uh, Van, that's because they're deacons at the church. And he says, oh, what's a deacon? He said, well, the Bible, and he talked a little bit about to Van about what the deacons were in a church and how they work at helping people and serving people. And after he did that for a while, Van said, okay, I get it. The more spiritual you are in church, the closer you get to sit to the front. (laughs) And the pastor said, no, it's not really like that, Van. But Somebody else come up to the pastor, and he had to quit talking with him, but that's the way he saw it and understood it. The more spirit you are, the closer you get to sit to the front. If that was true, I feel sad for y'all in the back today. (laughs) But But it's not true. So the next Sunday, Van got to church a little bit late, and he walked right in, and he walked right up to the front row where all those deacons were sprawled out. And he goes up to one of them, and he looked at him, and he said, listen, I saw you this past week, and you need to move back. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> he called it like it was. And the thing is, everybody in the church loved Van because he was honest, he told the truth, and he told it like he saw it. And that what happened to that church is it went through a revival. It went through a revival. Why? Because Van got hot. And that honesty, that truthfulness, that passion for God spread to the whole church. Now, it wasn't uh, politically correct. It wasn't always, he wasn't always discreet. He was tell it like it is, but God worked through him. And God works through people in different ways. And I'm going to ask you today, what parts of your life lack any sense of urgency? Do you know that the, uh, the Bible teaches, Revelation teaches, that the Lord is going to come back? We don't know the time. We don't know when, but it's when we least expect it. Uh, we're living in a culture right now where less than ever before do people go to church. And yes, it's a mission field in China. It's a mission field other places in the world, in Africa. But there's also a mission field right here, right here. And there's a lot of people today that uh, the, they wouldn't even think of going to church. They would think of doing other things. And I'm not saying that they're, they're, they're the worst sinners. We're all sinners. But we need to have a sense of urgency about us. In the last church, it said at the end of the letter to the last church, it said, I, I see your deeds. I see you, I place before you an open door that no one can shut. And I pray that that's what we have today. We have an open door and nobody can shut it. Uh, we're going to open it to people in this community. We're going to reach people for him. We're going to be on fire. Uh, Matthew 6, my life first. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. I pray that we all do that. We seek God first. We live, uh, the latest stats say 18% of the Christians in America say they put God number one in their life. No wonder our our church is to come back to the Lord. We're lukewarm. And some of them are even cold. Oh, we need to be on fire. We need to be sold out for God. We need to be living like God wants us to live. And when we do that, when we do the things God given us to do, life will change as we know it. Spiritually. Listen, we need the Lord. We need him to be number one in our lives. Each of us need that. And I pray that you see that happen in your life in the coming days. And may it start right now.